They praise Him for the wonders of His love. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save. For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us and whoever We'll live Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. We're going to sing There's Power in the Blood. <laughs> the world. five Sundays in a row now that we've been blessed to baptize someone. Amen. Amen. And uh, we've had baptisms on Sunday night, people joining on Wednesday nights, and so we're just so thankful for all that the Lord is doing, and we should never take that for granted. And uh, baptism is clearly taught that it is an outward sign of what has happened in someone's life when they repent of their sins and trust the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning, I am blessed to have with me Miss Tamsie Vopple. Go slow. There you go. Make sure everybody can see you and not me, all right? And um, had the privilege of uh, meeting with Tamsie a few weeks ago after the Lord had been dealing with her for a while. And, um, Tamsie, do you believe that Jesus died upon the cross, was buried, rose again, and is the Lord and Savior of your life? Amen. And so, pray with us. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing in Tamsie's life, Lord, and we just pray that you would continue to help her as she grows to follow you, to love you, and to make a difference in your kingdom, and Lord, to those around her. Father, thank you for the privilege of having watched her grow up 
And Lord, I'm so excited for what you're going to do in the future. And Lord, I just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so just turn right here. Put your hand up over your nose. Uh, I will entertain a motion to baptize in a second. I see a motion. Second, all of those in favor, shout amen. 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 By the authority given to me by this church, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're going to sing goodness of God. to do a song for you today. Uh, it's a new song for us. Our choir is going to sing it for you. You are welcome, and they would probably actually prefer it if you would sing along with us. We're go are you going to do the video now? We're going to do a video now, and then we'll do that. So here we go. And aren't we so glad to have baptisms in the morning and in the night? Amen. And so as always, we've talked about baptism is not a part of salvation. It is what happens after you're saved to declare to a lost and dying world or to other Christians that I'm a part of you. I'm a part of the family of God. I have been made new. And tonight we have something very special. We have a son and his mother. And it is so thankful, I'm 
so thankful to watch God at work, people of all ages. Amen? And so, uh, Bennett, you want to go first? Bennett has asked me and asked me and asked me and stopped me and got after me for months about, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And as always, we were cautious. We talked to him. But then he came in and said, I need my sins washed away. And uh, that's something only the Lord can do. And so, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross, <laughs> was buried and rose again, and is the Lord and Savior of your life? Amen. And so pray with us. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you so much for this young man and just the blessing that he is. I pray, Lord, that you'd help him as he grows to love you, to follow you, and to serve you. Lord, help us to love him and his family in a way that honors you and blesses him. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. I would entertain a motion in a second to baptize. All in favor, shout amen. Amen. You can, you can amen too. That sounds great. Bye. By the authority given to me by this church, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, Lord Christ and I have talked about the Lord many times over the last couple of years. And as I was talking to Bennett, he had got kind of nervous. And we had a, a last minute discussion Wednesday night. And I don't think that it was his nervous that the, why the Lord brought me them in here. Because I said, Mom, I think this would be a wonderful night for you to also follow the Lord. And uh, nervous, as always, as people are, but I'm so thankful tonight, amen, that she is willing to do that. And so, LaCrista, do you believe that Jesus died upon the cross, was buried, rose again, and is the Lord and Savior of your life? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing. Thank you so much for sending this family here, for how they've been a blessing to us, and just, Lord, how we can be a blessing to them. Lord, I pray that you would help them to grow in love towards you, to help her to be the mother, Lord, that you want her to be. Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful privilege. And we pray, Lord, that you would use them to reach others and that we would see more saved in this family. And, Lord, I ask it all in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I would entertain a motion and a second to baptize. I have them. All in favor, shout amen. 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 Just step right up here. Put your hand up over your nose. By the authority given to me by this church, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. to get out for teen a little bit so we're definitely off there today but um, it's good to be able to see all those people that came to know the Lord and followed him in baptism and I'm thankful for five weeks and hopeful that we'll have many many more so at this time our choir is going to sing a special for you again they would they would not care at all if you went ahead and sang along with us the words are going to be up there uh, so we can see them as well as here so that you're welcome to sing it along with us. Uh, I really like this song. It's entitled Firm Foundation, He Won't.
This morning we are going to be taking of the Lord's Supper. But before we take the Lord's Supper, we want to explain it and invite you to take it with us. You say, well, who should take the Lord's Supper? Well, one, if you are a child of God. If you have been saved, born again, brought into the family of God, we invite you to partake. You say, well, Jake, I've never been obedient to follow the Lord in baptism. Well, if you were saved yesterday and you haven't had a chance to be baptized, we would love for you to take the Lord's Supper with us. You say, well, Jake, I've been saved, but I'm not willing to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Well, that's between you and the Lord. Because the Bible tells us that we are to do this in remembrance of Him. But yet, we can take it in an unworthy manner and bring judgment onto our home. And so the Bible tells us that the Lord's Supper was given to us at a special time. In the book of Exodus, the children of Israel were in slavery. They were in bondage and they had no hope. And the Lord sent a man by the name of Moses to preach to Pharaoh, let my people go. And as you're familiar probably with that story, the first nine plagues, Pharaoh said, sure, but then no. But before the tenth plague, the one that would bring judgment on everything, God told the children of Israel to do something. In the book of Exodus chapter 12, it says to take out a lamb. And if a household is too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep or the goats. And that animal was to be perfect. And that animal was to be taken care of specially for 14 days. And at the end of that 14 days, that animal was to be killed. And the Bible says these words in Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. God said, kill that animal and spread the blood on the doorpost. And when the judgment time comes, I will see the blood and spare you. And when Jesus was celebrating the Passover meal with His disciples, this is exactly what was going on. And He explained to them that He was the Lamb. He was the one who came into the world that was perfect, was righteous, and He would be that sacrifice he would willingly let them kill him so that his blood could be shed. And we know that the Bible teaches us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. And so Jesus was that perfect lamb that was sacrificed for us. And when you and I get saved, something miraculous happens. The Spirit of God comes to live within us. And the blood is accounted to our account. And when the Father looks at your sin... He sees the blood. And that judgment that you and I both deserve, an eternity in hell, eternity away from God, the Lord passes over us and gives us a home in heaven. And that is what was going on when Jesus decided that it was time to teach His disciples and to show them what it meant. And so at this time, I'm going to ask that our deacons would come. And as they're coming to help serve the Lord's Supper, I want you to be thinking about, am I truly saved? Do I truly know the Lord Jesus Christ? Have I repented of my sins? Does His blood cover me? Because church membership doesn't save, baptism doesn't save, the Lord's Supper doesn't save. It is knowing Jesus. And so as they uncover this, this time... There are two elements. One, the bread represents the body of our Lord. And the juice represents the blood that was shed for you. And we're called to do this, one, to remember what the Lord has done for us. But also to celebrate what the Lord has done for us.
So just a moment as these men get ready to come around. If you are a child of God and want to take the Lord's Supper, we encourage you to take it. But if there's anything in your heart and life as a Christian that you're not willing to give up to God, we want to caution you against taking it. And so, but if you do take it, know that it's a reminder of what God has done for each and every one of us. Dave Johnson, would you pray over the elements? Father God, thank you for this opportunity here to come and praise you and worship you, God, with our remembrance of your great sacrifice. Uh, bless everyone here, Lord, and uh, give us all wisdom and a right heart. And we give you the praise and thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
hope you have had time to think about your relationship with the Lord and spend time in prayer under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But it says in the Word of God, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples. It said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This morning, if you were able to take the Lord's Supper, we hope that you are rejoicing in what Jesus has done for you. But if you couldn't take the Lord's Supper this morning, what this is a testimony to Jesus dying, buried, and being risen from the dead for your sins and mine. And today, you can be saved if you'll just put your faith and trust in Him. Bill Weber, would you close this portion of our service in prayer? Father, we thank you for your mercy. Father, to us for providing everything we need, Lord. For your great love that you have for us, Father, for us, for your faithfulness to us. Father, we pray that you continue in this spirit, Lord, so that we have this time with you, Lord, and that you'll be the first in our in our heart. This morning, as they finish covering the elements, if you have your copy of God's Word, we hope that you will find two places with us. The book of John, chapter 16, and the book of Mark, chapter 3. We are preaching through the book of Mark, verse by verse, line by line. But we came to one of the most challenging passages of Scripture in the New Testament, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. If you've been raised in a Baptist church, they looked at the Pentecostals and said, that's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. The Pentecostal churches looked at the Baptist church and said, look at them cold, dead churches. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And so you have this confusing world of, well, maybe I said something wrong that was blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But yet, the Bible tells us that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. And so when we got to chapter 3, verses 20, we stopped. And we went to the book of John and we looked at what is the Holy Spirit's job? What is He going to be doing in the world? And so what He is doing is what we must decide constitutes blasphemy by speaking against it, by rejecting it. And we looked at John chapter 16, how the Holy Spirit has come into the world to convict of sin. But not only to convict us of our sin, but to point us to righteousness, to point us to Jesus, what He has done for us but then also to warn us of the judgment to come. And we spent one week looking at each one of those. And we talked about how the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit of God is working and He's moving and He's dealing in your heart and He is trying to reveal to you that Jesus loved you, that Jesus died for you, that you are a sinner on your way to hell. And the gospel is preached when you say, No, that's not of God. It's not what I need for my life. I am going to reject Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that's the one sin that can ever be forgiving. Dying apart from a personal relationship with Jesus. And so this morning I want to read this passage of Scripture from John one more time because the last thing that the Holy Spirit is doing at work in the lives of redeeming people is He's the revealer of truth. This morning I want you to know something. There is nothing that I can say. There's nothing that we can sing. There's no program that we can have. There's no elements that we can use that can change your life if the Spirit of God is not at work and He is not moving and He's not working. And we've been looking at that because most people think that as long as I show up to church on Sunday, as long as we sing some songs... As long as we have a message, God must bless us. God must work. But the Bible nowhere teaches that God blesses us unless we do it His way. Unless we come to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Unless we get alone with God and repent of our sins. God does not work just because we 
ask Him to. We have to prepare our hearts. We have to be humble. And that is when a church can be blessed. Not when it's about my way or your way or my selfishness or your selfishness. Not my sin or yours. It's when we as God's people see the working of God in our lives and say, Lord, it's all about you. Lord, it's all about you. And so if you would stand with me out of a reverence to the reading of God's word, if you are able, in John 16, to see once again for the last time how the Holy Spirit is at work. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And don't miss these verses. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when the Spirit of truth has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take of what is Mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are Mine. Therefore I said that He will take of Mine and declare it to you. Pray with me. Father, this morning I come acknowledging that I am a sinner. Lord, that there is nothing good in me. There is nothing that I can offer this group of people except for you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would forgive me of any sin in my heart that would grieve or quench your spirit. Father, I pray this morning that for every hard heart today that you would begin to soften. Lord, for every lost person you would begin to draw. To every believer, Lord, you would soften us to repentance. And Lord, whatever needs to take place in this, in this building today, Lord, that you would do it and that you would get all of the glory. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so when we look through Mark chapter 3, this is really important. Because when you think about a sin that cannot be forgiven, that means that you will be separated from God forever. There is no home in heaven. There is no forgiveness of sin. We will stand before a holy God and hear these words, Depart from me, I never knew you. And so when we come to Mark chapter 3, there are some people that I want you to see. Because Jesus gives this warning to a group of people. And this morning, the, the message is still the same. You are here today to hear a warning from the Lord. To hear an encouragement from the Lord. To hear hope from the Lord. If you came to listen to someone speak, you would have been better off to turn on your television and listen to someone that can speak well. But this morning what we're praying for is the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and does what only He can do. That's change hearts and change lives. For far too long we have thought we could manipulate or encourage or do this on our own. But we can't. If God doesn't do it, it will not get done. And so when we look here in Mark chapter 3, I want you to see first that his family came to save him. His family came to save him. In verses 20 and 21, Then the multitude came together again so that he could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, He is out of his mind. In verses 31 and 32, if you jump down there with me. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside and sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. 
If you remember what's been going on, Jesus has been healing. He's been working. He's been moving. People have been healed. They've been delivered from demons. The blind has received their sight. Jesus has showed up on the scene and said, you are worshiping the rules of the Sabbath and not the Lord of the Sabbath. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I'm the one you need to worship. I'm the one you need to focus. Don't worry about all this other stuff. Worship me. And what happened was the multitudes of people had crowded him. They were following him. And his family's like, he's lost his mind. He's willing to give up everything for everyone else. Doesn't he know that he's making the Pharisees and the Sadducees mad? We just looked a few weeks ago about how they had devised in their hearts to destroy him. And so his family came thinking Jesus needed to be saved. They loved him. They cared about him. They were there for him. But I want to show you a second group of people here. His enemies that came to destroy him. Look at verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons he casts out demons. So he called them to himself and said in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But he has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. And whatever blasphemies they may utter. Now I want to stop right there. Because I want you to see the warning. There are two groups of people. Those that are there because they care about Him. There are those who are there that are concerned about Him. Now they don't understand, most of them, that He is who He is. But yet their hearts are in the right place. The other group is there because they know who He is. They've heard Him preach against them. And talk about them. And tell them to repent. And they hate Him. And they're there for the purpose of destroying him. And so they tell everybody, yes, these miracles are real, but this is Satan's power. This is demonic power. Do not follow him. This morning, I want you to know that you are here in one of two of those coup camps. You are here, one, because you know the Lord Jesus Christ. He has saved you, he has changed you, he has forgiven you, and you are his. Or the Spirit of God has been working on you. And you know that there's something missing. You know that there is something going on that's not right, that you're not where God wants you to be, and you're listening. But the other group of you are here today, and you have no desire to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Outwardly, you might look the part. You might be willing to sit on these chairs. You might even be willing to throw a little money in the offering. You might have just taken the Lord's Supper. But deep down in your heart, you know that you're the master of your life, the captain of your own ship. You're here because you just want your wife to quit nagging you, the co-worker that keeps trying to get you saved, to leave you alone. Or maybe you're here and you think Jesus is not too bad, but he can have part of my life and not the other half. And so preacher, no matter what you say today, it's not going to matter. No matter what God does, it doesn't matter. This morning I want you to know that that's you. You are in this second category. You are the one that is hearing the warning. And so you have two groups of people this morning. But what is the answer? Well, Jesus shows them that he doesn't need to be saved by his family and that his enemies cannot destroy him. But he has shown up to declare to a lost and dying world that he is the Son of God. That he is the one who has come into the world to take away sin. He is the one that can look into your brokenness and your shame and your past and your regret and all of the stuff that you're carrying and say, I can cover it all. I can forgive it all. I can wash you as white as snow. Look at verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, 
but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. So there's the warning. Today, that if you reject Jesus, that you reject what the Spirit of God is doing in your life, if you reject the light that is being shown into you, friends, there is no other way to be saved. There is no other way to go to heaven. There is no other way to be right with God. It's through Jesus, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, or it's nothing. You say, Jake, this is going to be a very discouraging sermon. Only if you say no. Because he looks at them, though, after they said, hey, your mom's here, your brothers are here, your sisters are here, and listen to what Jesus says. But he answered them, saying, who is my mother and brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and brothers. You see, you can be welcomed into the family of God. You can be a part of God's kingdom. You can have the promises and the blessings and the eternal life that God promised you. But there's only one way for that. Look what it says in verse 35. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. You see, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is put right here in all of this because you have two groups of people and a choice to make. And this morning, you have a choice to make. You say, well, Jake, I'm baptized. Being baptized doesn't get you to heaven. You say, Jake, I I took the Lord's Supper. Taking the Lord's Supper won't get you to heaven. You say, Jake, I'm a member of this church. I've been here longer than you've been alive. Friends, that won't get you to heaven. Jesus said the only way to be His family, to be a part of His kingdom, is to do the will of God. You say, well, I can't be perfect. I know I'm a sinner. I know I struggle. He didn't say perfection. He said to do what God told you to do. And the question is, what is that? To repent. When the Spirit of God dealt with you, whether it's today or whether it was when you were a kid or whether it was last week, and conviction began to set into your life about your sin, that was the Holy Spirit. When you begin to realize that Jesus did die for you, that He does love you, that He does want a relationship for you, that He would forgive you, that He conquered sin and death and the grave, you didn't realize that on your own. The Spirit of God is pointing you to Jesus. And then when you realize, should I choose yes or should I choose no? Should I accept the free gift or should I not? When that warning began to come to you that there is a devil's hell... There is an eternity away from God. That was the Spirit of God. And He says, I want to reveal truth to you and truth to me so that, friends, God can save us. The Bible tells us that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so today, as the Spirit of God works, you just have to respond. Whether it's yes, Lord, or no, You say, Jake, there is no evidence of this in the Bible anywhere else. Well, this is how I'm going to close today. You say, the sermon's almost done. You've not listened well, so you've got some more time to go, all right? But in Acts chapter 8, in Acts chapter 8, there was a preacher by the name of Philip. And there was a lost man. And the Spirit of God began to work and move. And this morning I want you to know that you are either the Ethiopian lost and the Spirit of God is working in you or if you're a Christian, you're the Philip who God is trying to send you to someone. And so let's look what it says, starting in verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is the desert. You say, well, Jake, I'm already a Christian. I'm not worried about the Holy Spirit and disobeying Him. If you are a child of God, God is wanting to send you to lost people. Whether it's where you work, whether it's where you go to school, whether it's the people you hang out with, God wants you who have been changed by Jesus to be like Philip and go to where people need hope. 
where people need to hear about forgiveness, where people need to hear about eternal life, where people need to understand that even though they might be broken, even though they might have shame and guilt and regret, even though their marriage might be falling apart, even though their place of employment might be a mess, that God loves them, that God has a purpose for them. And so look what he did in verse 27. And so he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship. You see, God was preparing this man's heart. He wasn't worshiping Jesus yet, but yet he was worshiping according to the Old Testament. He had a knowledge of God. He had a willingness toward God. God had brought him to a special place. And you say, well, Jake, if God had brought someone to me while I was driving down the road, I'd be saved too. Friends, God might not have done that, but He brought you here this morning. And that is not an accident. It's not a chance. Whatever reason brought you here, a nagging spouse, a a disgruntled this, the last opportunity, whatever brought you here today, the Spirit of God is trying to use. He's trying to work. And so look here, and was returning in verse 28, and sitting in the chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit, the Spirit of God at work, said to Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you were reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? That word for guide is the same word that is used where we read in the book of John that said the Holy Spirit will guide you. You see, friends, the Spirit of God uses the Word of God and us explaining the Word of God to change people's lives. Why is it so important for you as a Christian to know God's Word? So that when someone is reading the Word of God or has a question of the Word of God, you can point them to Jesus. That you can explain to them that God loves you, that He has a purpose for you. Because what is this man reading? He's reading this. And Philip asked to come up and sit with him. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and as a lamb before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his justice was taken away and who will declare his generation? was talking about the fact that Jesus was going to die. The fact that Jesus was going to be the sacrifice. The fact that Jesus was going to take our punishment and shame on Calvary's cross. And he says, this is what you're reading. And this morning the message is still the same. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He arose. And he has taken your sin and shame and guilt. If you'll let him. It goes on and says in verse 34, So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture preached Jesus to him. He preached Jesus to him. Friends, that's why we go verse by verse, word by word. Why? Because the Spirit of God uses the Word of God. You don't need self-help. You don't need five easy steps. What you need is the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and it will make you the husband God wants you to be, the wife God wants you to be, the manager of money God wants you to be, the friend God wants you to be, the employee. However God is trying to use you, what you need is yielding to the Spirit and submission to God's Word. Those two things will change everything in your life. And so it goes on and says, Now as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. One hinders me from being baptized. Then Philip said, If, don't miss that, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He didn't say, there's water, let me be baptized to be saved. He says, if you believe, and you have been saved, born again by this message of hope through Jesus Christ, 
let's find you a place to be baptized. He didn't say, let's find you a puddle. He didn't say, let's you find you a bucket. He said, let's find a body of water that's big enough for me and you to get in. And let's do this. And what you have seen this morning is this very same thing. You have seen the young lady baptized this morning. You say, Jake, why did we see a video of some being, someone being baptized? Because that was Sunday night. You say, well, what about the first service? They get to watch these videos every time. Because why? We want to be a church that celebrates God changing people's lives. And if we're not, there's no point for us to exist. If lives being changed, people being willing to stand before you and say, I was a sinner, but now I'm saved. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was lost, but now I am found. I was hopeless, but now I have hope. Jesus has changed me. If that cannot cause us to celebrate, to rejoice, to have excitement, look up here, what you're worshiping is something other than Jesus. You're worshiping some idea, some feeling, some thought. And you say, Jake, what does this mean? This means this morning that the message and warning that Jesus gave is still the same. Don't blaspheme the Spirit. What was Jesus doing? He was trying to show them who He was by doing the miracles. The miracles were just evidence of what He was, who He was. The Old Testament predicted this is what He's going to do. This is who He's going to be. And He came to His own first. And they believed Him not. And so this morning, if you're here and the Spirit of God is dealing with you, you can say yes. You can say, yes, Lord, I know that it's you. I know that you are who you say you are. And I want life, not judgment. And the Bible says, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. God promised that. But the Bible also says that if you say no, I am not going to be saved. I'm not going to believe that this is a God thing, that God's at work. The Bible says your heart will begin to harden. And the Bible says if you do that long enough, God God will harden it for you on top of that. So I've started saying this because what I used to say was wrong. I used to say you could come to church and be changed or you can leave the same way that you came, but that's not right. You can either leave changed or you will leave worse than you came. Because when you begin to say no to the Spirit of God, it says your heart will begin to harden and harden, and harden, and harden. I'm thankful that God keeps working, keeps moving, keeps dealing with us. But friends, I can promise you that if you will say no to Him long enough, and long enough, and long enough, and long enough, that heart of yours will become like stone. That's how some of you sit through church every Sunday. Doesn't matter what's said, don't matter what scripture's read, you are as cold and as dead and have no response. You say, Jake, I I don't agree with that. Well, you're wrong. It doesn't matter. You say, well, I know I'm saved. I just have got no joy. Well, you might be saved, but what you've got in your life is something that shouldn't be there. And you're saying no and no and no, and that has robbed you of the joy that God wants you to have, the peace that God wants you to have. And so my challenge to you today is to listen to the Spirit as He works whether it's a specific sin in your life today as a Christian, whether it's you know God wants you to be more vocal about your faith like Philip. You're like, Jake, but I just hate the people I work with and I'm so tired of them and they, they don't like it when I talk about Jesus or they don't like it when I share my testimony or what if I drive them farther away? Look up here. You neither draw people closer to Jesus nor push them away. That's their heart. All you can do is talk about how good God has been to you. And you can live in such a way that shows that God has changed you. Outside of that, friends, it's all up to God. It's all up to Him. But how we'll close today is this. You have a choice to make. To choose life, forgiveness, hope, and love. Or to be like the Pharisees and say, God doesn't want me. I don't want him. 
I don't care what light the Spirit shows me. I want no part of it. And friends, if you die with that in your heart, you've committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And you'll spend an eternity away from a God who loves you in a place that wasn't created for you. But yet all sin must be punished. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Not my words, but yours. And Lord, today you know the hearts of every person in this place. Lord, you know that we can lie to you, we can hide our sins, we can grandstand who we are. But Lord, your spirit knows. And so Lord, in this place today, I pray first and foremost for the lost. For those that are here that don't know you. Whether they're in this building or in the children's facility, Lord that your spirit is dealing with them. Lord, what a great morning it will be to see people saved. Father, I pray that your spirit is working and moving, and God, that you would give them the heart to respond, to come to know you. Father, I pray for the child of God in this place today that's, that's rebelling, that's running from you, that is living in hypocrisy. Lord, that you would deal with each and every one of us that we would realize that we are robbing ourselves of your blessing. And third and finally, Lord, I pray for the Christian who needs to take that step of faith and do more, to be more faithful, to be used like a Philip when wherever you send them. Lord, whatever happens today, we know that you're the only one that can do anything. And we give you all the praise and the honor. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you would stand with us as every head is bowed, every eye is closed, these altars are open for you to come and respond in salvation, for you to come and pray for a lost family member, a lost friend, for you to come and get alone and say, God, there's things in my heart that I know shouldn't be there, and I need you to deal with them, Lord. Maybe this morning you've accepted Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, but you've never taken that step of obedience. We've already got a baptism scheduled in two weeks. We can schedule one tonight. We can schedule one next week for you to take that public step of what's already happened in your life. some hearts this morning what are you holding on to you say if I could just get out of this service I'll be fine friends you won't if God's dealing with you this morning not some overweight preacher screaming at you but the spirit of God is dealing in your heart this morning you can let him break you free from that you can let him work and move or friends, it'll harden. And I'll be honest with you, I've been there before. I've hardened my heart as a Christian, and you don't realize it until it's almost too late. Well, I just don't like people anymore. Or people are more trouble than they're worth. Friends, our bitterness, our unforgiveness, our hard-heartedness, should never come before the fact that God loves sinners. That God loves the broken and the hurting. God even loves the sinners that have hurt you. God even loves the sinners that have hurt me. Maybe today it looks like it's unforgiveness. Something's happened with your children, with your marriage. And you say, Jake, I'm forgiven, but I will never forget. 
Friends, you're holding on to something that God doesn't want you to hold on to. He wants you to lay it down. Let Him restore that joy to you. Let Him restore that peace to you. The Bible tells us where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. God wants to set you free. The Holy Spirit doesn't make you miserable. He breaks the shackles that sin will hold you in. That Satan will try to bind you in. You say, well, Jake, I look the part. Friends, God knows the heart. You can dress the right way. You can talk the right way. But God knows our heart. The secret places that no one else knows. And the Spirit begins to work, deal, and move. And it can change. As always, we want to thank you for being here today. We'd love to have you back tonight. And we'd love to pray for you or help you in any way possible. So, Brother Dave Johnson, would you close us in prayer?